Hey guys, welcome to St. John's Church YouTube channel. Uh, my name is Eric Wittig. I've been a historic interpreter here since December of 2011. Best job I've ever had in my life. Um, I want to talk to you guys today about some connections that we have in the church and on the grounds to the Masonic fraternity. Uh, if you guys haven't seen the two episode series with Amy Schwartz and F. Carey Howlett, definitely go back and check that out. Uh, Carey did the conservation work on the sounding board and talked about a lot of things that are going to connect Freemasonry to the sounding board, and I'm going to go into that a little bit. Specifically, the era of enlightenment between 1714 and 1789. During that time, Masonry was really, really popular. There was a surge in membership, and a lot of the way people were thinking about the fraternity uh, had really boomed at that point in time. Since the church was built in 1741, right in the middle of that era of enlightenment, you see a lot of crossover with those symbols. And uh, so we're going to dive into talking about the sounding board right away. Uh, the sounding board was a part of the original church here. It was gifted to the church in, when the church was completed in 1741. We're not certain who made it, which adds to some of the mystery of that. Um, but you can definitely see uh, the, with the image of the Grand Master's jewel. Uh, this is the Grand Master of Masons in Virginia wears this jewel for Masonic ceremonies. And at first glimpse, these two images look identical. Um, they're a little bit different. The sounding board has less straight and wavy rays that protrude out of that. Um, but you can definitely tell that there is a connection there. Um, this jewel is a really neat piece of history. This was crafted by Paul Revere, uh, the silversmith from Massachusetts. And it was intended for George Washington. And on the back of it, it is inscribed that it is to be given to George Washington, Grand Master of Masons in Virginia, Washington never served as Grand Master of Masons in Virginia, uh, but it was presumed that he would, and that really kind of shows how much respect that those men had for him at that point in time, both in and outside of the Masonic fraternity. Um, but uh, that jewel shows the, you see three images kind of all overlaid on top of one another. Uh, the conservator, uh, Mr. Howlett, had looked and found three different types of wood, several different types of wood in fact, uh, to show that you had a sun, a moon, and a human figure all superimposed on top of one another there, which is uh, an, an enlightened uh, image. If you do a Google image search right now on your laptop, or most people are probably looking at this on their phones, you can, if you type in sun, moon, face, you'll see page after page of variations of these images come up. So this image isn't exclusive to the Masonic fraternity or to, at the time, the Anglican Church or the Episcopal Church. Uh, it's a symbol of the Enlightenment, and since Masonry was really prominent during the era of Enlightenment and the church was, the structure here was built during the Enlightenment, you see that crossover pretty strongly here. I uh, also want to show an image of the Senior Deacon's Jewel that is uh, worn by senior deacons here in Masonic Lodges, a little bit about some of the structure within the titles of Freemasonry. Masonry is structured a lot like a school. Uh, individual classrooms would be the equivalent of Masonic Lodges, and the head of the classroom, in this, in this case, would be the teacher. Uh, in Masonry, that would be the master of the lodge. Everything that goes on in the lodge, is, that falls on the shoulders of the master of the lodge. Uh, and then at the head of every school is a principal. Uh, so he is in charge of the teachers and by proxy all of the students. In this case, that would be the Grand Master. So this is an elected position. They serve for one year. Uh, they're elected by the body of, uh, of, of the Masons and each Grand Master and Grand Lodge is sovereign. So here in the United States, we have 51, one for each state and then the, the district as well. So this jewel, uh, there, there are over 300 lodges in Virginia and this jewel is worn by the senior deacon of every lodge. So these are mass produced. They're not as intricate or ornate as what we see with the, with the jewel that you see that was made by uh, Paul Revere. Um, but you can still see the connection and where it, where it draws from. Here on Church Hill, we also have another connection to masonry in the vicinity. Uh, the church here was built in 1741 and there is Mason's Hall at 18th and Franklin at Shaco Bottom. Mason's Hall is the uh, oldest Masonic Lodge in the United States that's been continuously used for Masonic purposes and tons of prominent Freemasons have uh, visited there. Uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, John Marshall was master of that lodge. 
and uh, the foundation here has got a great connection with that lodge. They do a lot of open house tours, and um, this year it might be a little bit of an exception due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but a uh, great group of guys down there. Some of the men that are uh, associated with St. John's um, and, and the fraternity alike, uh, John Marshall is a, is, has a connection here. His father, Thomas, was a delegate to the Second Virginia Convention in 1775. When, his, uh, when Patrick Henry spoke. Uh, John Marshall uh, eventually served as master of Mason's Hall and uh, most likely would have periodically worshiped here at St. John's. His mother church would have been, um, would have been a memorial church that was put, put up after the theater fire in, in 1811. Another, another prominent figure, in my opinion, probably no one has done more for Freemasonry in Virginia than Dr. John Dove. Uh, he's buried here at St. John's as well. Uh, lifelong Richmonder, he is the longest serving Grand Secretary of Masons in Virginia, served for over 40 years in that capacity. Uh, he did a lot of work in a, a lot of appendant bodies, um, Scottish Rite and the York Rite appendant bodies as well. Uh, represented Virginia Freemasonry at two national conventions in the 1840s and uh, a prolific Masonic author. Um, there's a lot written on Freemasonry. That's a big misnomer. A lot of people think that there are a lot of, there's a lot of secrecy around the fraternity, but there are volumes and volumes written on, on uh, Freemasonry and, uh, and the esoterics behind a lot of what happens uh, in the Masonic fraternity. Uh, he was so well thought of that when he passed away, the Grand Lodge of Virginia erected an obelisk that you can see at Hollywood Cemetery with a lot of Masonic symbols on that stone, and it's definitely worth a visit. Dr. John Dove was also extremely influential in the cornerstone laying for the Washington equestrian statue that we see here at the Capitol as well. James Mercer served as Grand Master of Masons in Virginia from 1785 to 1786. He's buried on the grounds. He was also a delegate to the Second Virginia Convention in 1775. And then Peyton Randolph is the Provincial Grand Master of Masons in Virginia. He presided over the convention in 1775, and we have a good image of him wearing his uh, jewel of his office as Master of the Lodge. Uh, George Washington, Commander of the Continental Army, was a delegate to the Second Virginia Convention, uh, representing his uh, home county of Fairfax. And uh, a guy that's really fun to talk about is Peter Francisco. They called him the Virginia Giant. Uh, the man grew to be nearly seven feet tall. Uh, he was here when Patrick Henry spoke in 1775, and he had a really interesting story. Uh, he was kidnapped from the Azor Islands as a child. Uh, the pirates who kidnapped him didn't speak Portuguese, so they couldn't get the ransom money, and they dumped him in modern-day Hopewell, and there's a statue in front of the courthouse to commemorate this. He was taken to what was then called a poorhouse, and he was later adopted by Judge Anthony Winston of Buckingham County. Uh, Winston served as a delegate from Buckingham to the convention, and he brought Francisco with him. And Francisco was so inspired by Patrick Henry's speech that he wanted to join the Continental Army immediately. Winston made him wait, but he eventually did serve. And there are some really cool stories of just Herculean feats of strength. The U.S. Post Office put a commemorative stamp together of him carrying a cannon off the field of battle manually. Uh, so the man grew to be nearly seven feet tall in all the portraits that I've seen of him. This guy was just an ox of a man. He was huge, probably 300 pounds. And um, he had a special broadsword commissioned uh, so that he could carry it into battle. With a man that large, a regular sword probably would have felt like a toothpick. And we've got an image here uh, depicting actor uh, Kevin Grant giving a descendant of Peter Francisco a replica of that broadsword. And there's also a replica of that sword at Mason's Hall that you can see at their open houses. Uh, Francisco served as um, sergeant at arms at the General Assembly for several years, uh, and he's buried in Shaco Cemetery. He was buried with full Masonic honors, and Mason's Hall occasionally will do a wreath laying ceremony at his grave. One of the rectors of St. John's, uh, Reverend John Points, was also a Masonic brother. He died in 1860, and there is an obelisk uh, placed in his memory by his Masonic brethren and by the parishioners of the church. General George Pickett, uh, this was his mother church as well. He was a member of the fraternity. 
Uh, in all, we know of nine of the 56 signers to the Declaration of Independence were members of the Masonic fraternity. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's quite an honor that we have uh, scores of brothers here buried uh, on St. John's as well. Some more of the symbols that we see here on the grounds, the square and the compasses. Uh, masonry becoming really prominent during the Enlightenment. Um, the, I guess a, a, a red letter year for Freemasonry would have been 1717. This is when the United Grand Lodge of England is formed. Uh, masonry existed before that. Masonry has existed since ancient times when stonemasons were coring uh, four stones and then shaping the stones, bringing them to a job site where the master mason would, would lay them. Uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of the symbols that you see in the Masonic fraternity, uh, in 1717 you saw a shift from what we call operative masonry, actual stone masonry, to speculative or Freemasonry. And a part of masonry is uh, drawing a parallel to the symbols and making a moral application to them. And the square is one of those. Uh, the square in the construction trades is used to ensure that you have a, a 90 degree angle uh, for in masonry to ensure that you have the most structural integrity for that block for when you turn it over to the master mason, uh, it's going to be as strong as it possibly can be. And in Freemasonry today, uh, the term fair and square comes from this. A lot of people don't know that. Um, you're, you're to use the square to uh, judge all of your actions and words to ensure that you're being as fair and, squ and square with people as you possibly can be. So it has a, that moral application. The way masonry is structured, it draws on more of a connection to uh, an apprentice and a, and a, and a trade. Uh, so there are three degrees in Freemasonry that correlate to um, seeking a trade in, in, modern day, uh, in the modern day work world. You come in as an apprentice, then you are passed to a journeyman, and then you are eventually a master of your craft, whether that's stonemasonry or uh, electrician or carpentry, plumbing, what have you. Masonry is very much the same uh, in, in the same way. You come in as an entered apprentice, uh, you are passed to fellow craft or journeyman, and then eventually you are a master mason. And each of these symbols are revealed to you that teach a moral application to them. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite examples, uh, inside of every Masonic Lodge there are two stones. Uh, and these represent, there's one that's rough and one that's smooth. And this is supposed to teach that we're brought into the world uh, rude and imperfect by nature with this rough stone. And using the gavel, we can break away the parts of our life that are vices and superfluities to form yourself as a, as a better person. So we're never going to ever reach that perfect ashlar or that perfect state of being, but you can constantly strive for it. And that's something that's, that's, that's truly noble.